Goodness gracious, it's nice to see you. <laughs> Some of you, or a number of you, have been asking me, ask us, and that's appropriate about my son Josh and what's going on with him. And I want to thank you, first of all, for your prayers. And the, God has brought us this far. He's still in the hospital. He's on a ventilator. He's fighting pneumonia, and he's very weak. And uh, we solicit and continue to ask your prayers for him. And we're so thankful that uh, he is somewhat stable. And uh, we just look and see what God will do in raising him up. And I know that uh, there's any number of you that are facing difficulties. I know that. And we need to be reminded to be in prayer for one another. Uh, we have, I know Herb Langthorpe has asked for his sister Susan, who's in the hospital. Uh, we have our brother Lynn Jolly that's in the hospital. And uh, uh, we're praying for him. I understand he's stable right now, and we're thankful for that. And lo and behold, we have two missionaries with us this morning, Dave and Beth Jolly back here. And they're here, obviously, because of Lynn, and we're so thankful to see them from the other side of the world, and, and uh, we're glad you're here this morning with us, and we'll want to greet you in love. Now, we are studying in a passage here that was read this morning, and if you're one that follows the outline, which is fine, you're going to find that I'm not going to get to that verse 22 to 24 that has to do with commands to wives. I may disappoint you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, after I looked at this, I decided that the text that we have today, just found in verse 21, is just too important. Now, I, I just want you to, to remember that we are studying in a section of Scripture that is built upon the foundation of the first three chapters in Ephesians, which have to do with our the great doctrine of our calling in Christ Jesus, our great salvation, what God has done uh, to call a people, as he says in chapter 2 and verse 4, but God made us alive. And that is so very important because if God doesn't make you alive, my friend, you're dead in trespasses and sins. There is no hope. But Jesus Christ is a Savior. He is God and He saves but he doesn't save us uh, just to sit on our do-nothing, so to speak. He saves us to be in a process of sanctification where we become more and more like Christ until he takes us to glory. And that's what all of these events in our life are about. God is the sovereign, working all things together for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. And we have that truth and that reality that, by the way, we all cling to, and we must cling to, and we need to cling to, that God knows what he's doing, that we can trust him, and that he's working. He, haven't, he hasn't left us to be spoiled children of God, but he's working his work in us for eternity and for glory. And so when we get to chapter 4 and verse 1, we're dealing with this whole idea of walking worthy of the calling for which you have been called. That's what it's all about. And in 4.17 to, to where we are now in, in chapter 5, verse 29, 21, we have personal commands before God vertically, directly to us as his children as to what is the will of God for our lives. That's what we're to operate under. We were previously walking according to our own will. Now we have a master. Now we have a savior. Now we have a Lord of our life, and we are to walk as Christ walked. Remember, he repeatedly said, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And we are to do the will of the Father. And so that's what we have been studying and now there's a little change to how we are to act, not just in direct relationship to God, but also in relation to others. And so now we're beginning, he's going to have a little shift here onto the horizontal. And we have said that no person can do what God requires. So this is not a list of do's and don'ts in that sense. 
It is only for God's people that have been born again that can comply with the first three chapters of Ephesians and built on the very power and authority of God and the Spirit of God working in us, can we begin to try to fulfill what is pleasing to God, as he says in this very context, to do the will of God. And part of that will will be in our relationships with one another. And he's going to talk about the key relationships of life, husband and wife, parents to children, and then in that context, it had to do with masters to slaves, but in today's world, it would have to do with bosses to subordinates. And so all of those things are very important, and then just everybody in general in that sense. And that's what verse 21 speaks of. We have this verse that it ironically ends the section of this direct commands from God in verse 21. That's the end of that paragraph. But it's also the introduction to this new section, our walk with God in relation to others. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that our walk with God is dimensional, isn't it? It's not just one thing or it's a multiplicity of things, which means that in this, it has to do with who I am inside. I have to be fundamentally changed. It has to do, in other words, with my attitude. And the attention here turns to the command of the will of God in my relation to you and your relation to me and our relation to one another, which is so very, very important. And it stands to reason if there is any breakdown of commitment to do God's will directly with him, then what follows will be a breakdown of all other relations, those that are horizontal. And that's part and parcel if we look around us to our society that has denied God, refused to, to listen to God, refused to his word, and is set out to, to do their own thing which is contrary to God. And so there's all manner of breakdowns not only with God, but with each other. And so we live in this dog-eat-dog -dog society, ever more increasing in darkness, and that is all part and parcel of this. Now, for you and me, who name the name of Christ, and I trust are born again, our responsibility is to listen to God, as he has told us to make the most of our time, back in verse 16, and to strive to live with each other in the manner of Jesus Christ himself. I won't go there, but in Acts chapter 10, uh, verse 38, he says, it says of Christ that he went about doing good. He went about doing good. Now that is a universal manner of speaking that, but it was such that at his crooked trial, there was no possibility of an accusation of him that had any true merit. Because Christ Jesus never spoke a careless word to any person at any time. He never said anything untrue. He never had a wrong motive about anything he did. He had no selfishness. No selfishness. He is our standard. Remember that it says in chapter 5, in verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. We are to be imitators of Christ. We are to become more and more Christ-like. And that's what this whole section is about. Isn't it wonderful to have the will of God right here? Our creator, our judge, our Savior, our all. He's telling us what to do. And so that's where I am today as we look at verse 21. And so first of all, it, I, I got carried away and let me bow and ask God to help us now. That's what we need is prayer to, for him to help us, please. Father, we come again to your holy and precious word, always mindful of our need for it, 
We ask you, Father, by your Spirit to fill us up, to show us who you are, who we are to be. Oh, Lord, that we might walk with you as Enoch walked with you, and that others in faith have walked with you over the annals of time and in the troubles of life. Oh, take us aside now and show us what we are to be before you, Father, and give us the strength to be that. Make us lights, Father, lights in the world. Oh, this world so desperately needs to know you. May we be those that exemplify who you are. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, by the way, meism, and if you don't know what meism is, that's meism, and that's also youism for you. <laughs> meism is I'm all about me. And we are naturally all about me from the time we're born. It's called selfishness. And it's a plague to the human race. It's because we're, let, we're lost in sin, we're dead in sins, and it began in the fall into sin when Adam and Eve rejected God's truth and believed Satan and went after that which cast the entire human race into this terrible condition. And every person is born with this meism. You're born with it and I'm born with it. And even just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I still don't have meism. The difference is that I now have the Holy Spirit, I have the direction from God, and I am to fight and combat my own personal meism, and I have the ability to do that, and I don't have any excuse not to do it, because I have the very commands of God. But you see, living is not all about us. We are not any one of us, the center of the universe. Jesus Christ. All authority has been given him in heaven and on earth. He is the creator. He is the God. He is the Lord. And we have his will right here. And so this will must push my will aside and I take on him. And if our thinking is straight... That is what we want in relation to all we come in contact with. We want to exemplify God's will so that when we reach the end of our time on earth, we will hear, well done. Good and faithful servant. This is what, this is what faith is all about. Faith is not a one-time decision. Faith is living for Christ right now. And the next minute, and the next hour, and the next day, and et cetera, et cetera, on forward. And we've already seen that our attitude must change from self-will, what? To God's will. And he, he talks about that in this very context, verse 10, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And where do we learn that from? We learn it from God's Word. He has revealed it to us. That's what the New Testament is all about, these wonderful precious commands to us is the revelation of God's mind to us that we might know him. And so we get to the fact that we have witnessed many disagreements among even brethren, haven't we? Fussing like children over near pointless issues. You know, children do that with toys, don't they? And I'm not trying to pick on the kids, but you do that. You get to fussing and fighting, well, she did this and he did that, and, and all this kind of stuff. Well, adults do the same thing on a larger scale. And maybe we, maybe we learn to be a little more politically correct about it. So we bite our lip and count to ten or something else and go stand in the corner. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're going to be talking about an attitude that must pervade every bit of of our life. I've called it here even at one point I was going to use the word constitution because it is our constitution. It becomes what is our guiding principles of living which should be fostered and brought forth from reading and studying God's word and his mind for us as to what he wants us to do. Now I've seen 
all kinds of things in my experience and leadership in the church. The first church that Jan and I were in up in Amarillo, uh, we finally got to a place where we could build a building. And, and we, by the grace of God, built a beautiful building. And then one of the most prominent families in the church got all bent out of shape because they didn't like the wallpaper in the nursery. And I'm not making that up. And they left the church, and because they left the church, some other people left the church. Now, we can sit back and look and say, that is the silliest thing that I've ever heard. Yes, it is. But that's the kind of thing that goes on even among God's people in a church when we start looking at each other and fussing, and I don't like this, and you like that, and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And that's exactly where Paul is focused here. On verse 21, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And, of course, that carries into these big issues of marriage, children, bosses. But it has to do with all of these issues. Not just them. It has to do with everything about this. And this, again, is an attitude. And so I've called it here seed for others. Uh, because I needed to see. And uh, seed is to relinquish, to yield or transfer my right to another. Why? For their good. Now, doesn't that sound like love? Because it is. That's what love is, is putting another above us. It's an attitude that must pre prevail over incidental things, self things. We're not talking here about essential doctrine or uh, but we're only talking about preferences and opinions and all of that, which really doesn't matter. You may like red and I like blue or something else. Well, so what? It doesn't really matter. We are to seed for others. Now, the word here, looking at verse 21, and be subject, and of course, this is built upon all that he has been telling us about how we're to redeem our time, how we're to be seeking to be pleasing to the Lord, we're to transfer our will for His will and change that and do what is pleasing to Him and to live for Him, and that's what it's all about. It's not about me, it's about Him. And so he says, be subject to one another. Subject is hupotasso, which means be accountable. It has to do, it's an accounting term. I'm accountable to you, and you're accountable to me. And you, you, it, it has to do with be, being subdued or under. It is actually a military term, which means to rank under. In other words, at any given point on things that are incidental and really don't matter, I must be willing to rank myself under you. Now, I don't care if you're a private or a general. It doesn't really matter as far as your human relationship with God. But when I was in the military, and as high as I got was an E-5, you know, if, if an E-6 came along, you know, I, I had to listen to what they had to say, and I had to rank myself under them. Not alone someone like Colonel Warmoth over here. I'd, you know, whatever he said, I'd turn a flip. But you understand what I mean. That is part and parcel of what we're to do. That doesn't mean that that person before God is any more important than anybody else, but it is a ranking. And by the way, our Lord Jesus, equal with God the Father, set the example by ranking himself under God the Father. Lord, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. Now, the lost person has no sense of concern for God and for His will. But you see, this is God's will in our relationship with one another. Otherwise, we're going to be fussing and falling out and troubled and gossiping and irritated and all that all the time. Because we're all different and we're going to rub each other raw in the wrong way. 
A lost man is selfish. And we're not to be selfish, self-seeking, only thinking of themselves. The saved man thinks, what, first of God and pleasing Him and serving Him, and secondly should be thinking in terms of how can I be of benefit to others that they might know this true and living God themselves. And then all this other stuff becomes so incidental and unimportant things that people trip over and run into like a brick wall on a day-to-day -day basis. And you have to realize that to live this way with this kind of attitude has love written all over it. We cannot stoop to put someone ahead of us from our heart without agape love. Otherwise, self will master the situation even if you grit your teeth. And say, I'm going to try to do this. That's not from the heart. This needs to be a heart of love. In the maturing Christian, it works like this. When our understanding is truly enlightened, when we see ourselves as we really are, I hate to tell you this, because the world wants to tell you about all your self-esteem and all these kinds of things. That's not what the Bible says. In our sinful state, we're ugly, deserving of hell. And as God sees us, we are foolish, hopeless sinners. And when we see that, we stop boasting and stop thinking we are deserving and entitled. And then reactions to personal offenses by others, which are related to our pride, must be overcome in Christ Jesus by this new life and new attitude given in Scripture, and I'll even call it again a new constitution. And this is so clear throughout Scripture. Look with me at Romans chapter 12, and Romans follows the same pattern as Ephesians. That is, it's built upon doctrine until we get to chapter 12, where we're to, we're to what? Present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God as a result of being saved, as a result of the special relationship God has with His own by faith and transforming them. But then when He gets to verse 3, notice the very first thing beyond the fact that we're in verse 2, we are to live the transformed life, life by the renewing of our mind, being in the Scriptures, following the Scriptures, same pattern as Ephesians chapter 5, knowing what the will of God is, he says, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. There it is. Why? Because we naturally think we're the center of the universe. We naturally think in terms of Meism, which must be changed to his, you want to call it hisism. We can call it that, I guess. Not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have what? Sound judgment. That's what this is all about. So that I don't lose my perspective on incidental and silly and foolish things like the world does. Instead, I have a, a connection to the Scripture, through the Scripture and the Holy Spirit, to my Heavenly Father who is guiding and directing me, and I can understand what is important and not what's important, and not get hooked up on all the incidental, unimportant things of the world that drive mankind in every direction, being held captive to do the will of Satan, because that's what happens with all of that. So it's very important. Look over as well to Matthew. Let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. Very important. There's, there's, there's never been a greater message and sermon. And of course, we recently studied this. 
uh, together, and it's so, so very important. Here's a particularly hard section when we get to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 38 that I, that I excuse me, should be chapter 5 verse 3. There is no 38 in chapter 6. Notice chapter 5 verse 38. What does Christ say here, this hard section? You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. All right, well, there are some balancing things because God was in a theocracy. He was over Israel in the Old Testament, and so the court system and all that was associated with God. But that's not the attitude of day-to-day concourse among Christians, and that's what he's bringing out here. Remember, he started with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. All of those having to do with a transformed heart. And so he gets to verse 38. You heard this. In other words, you had wrong thinking when you're thinking that's what God intended here. You have heard is the idea. But he's going to speak differently. He says in verse 39, But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Christ is developing here an attitude. And we will see, well, we would see, I'm not going to go there, but we would see in the second part of this verse, this personal constitution. If you look at verse 39, he says, don't, resist an evil person. As explained by the examples, this is an issue or not an issue of life or death. It's not a criminal coming. He's talking here about us interacting with one another as explained by the examples and not an issue here of a criminal that's entered your house, but things of a very personal nature. The idea, of course, of a slap has been used to uh, exhibit disrespect. That's what it meant. When somebody slaps you, it's an act of disrespect. And it may hurt for a, a little bit. It's certainly demeaning. And it symbolizes an offense of one's honor. It's temporary, though. It goes away. It has no lasting effect. It's just an indignity. And here he says, someone wants to treat you with indignity, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Instead of retaliating, turn to the other side, symbolizing this non-avenging, non-retaliatory, humble, gentle spirit said to characterize, characterize God's own. In all situations, we must ask ourselves, what makes us different than the unsaved? You know, I, I've always been raised up and had a, my scuffles on the playground. And when somebody slugged me, I slugged them back. But we're not talking about that. This idea of demanding our rights instead of leaving it in God's hand. And you, he, he elaborates on this down in verse 40 of Matthew 5. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt... Let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him two. This is an attitude, a willingness, in other words, to stoop on behalf of others. God places you and he places me in interactions with people continually, starting as these children, again, fighting over toys and grown-ups fighting and squabbling amongst themselves. And Christ says, Stop it. It needs to stop with you. You need to have the attitude of Christ. Are there people around, even in the church, that want to put you out? You better believe it. Are there people around that will run over you? Yes. Are there all manner of inequities, small and large? Yes. But it's not the inequity that matters. But you know what matters? It's how we react to it. How 
we react to it. You and I are being tested. Take the mind of Christ. Take the will of God. These things are not to fret us. God knows the circumstances. Trust Him. Leave the inequities to Him. It's not the inequity, but how we react. And so what is Christ addressing here? Once again, He's addressing the heart. He's addressing the heart. Are you willing to part with your dignity? Are you willing to part with your rights or whatever on behalf of someone else? Because that's contrary to fallen nature, isn't it? But we're supposed to be above that. You know, as Christians, we are going to be living together eternally in perfect bliss. And when I get over to Revelation 21, I don't find any squabbling in heaven. No, there's not any. And, and the tendency may be, well, in your mind to think, well, that's because all those other people are going to get straightened out. <laughs> no. It's because we're all going to get straightened out. We are finally going to have the complete mind of God in Christ. Let me put this in the form of asking some questions that I ask of myself because I struggle with this too. Believe me, I do. Do we place a higher value on love for God and love for others than all the temporary impediments, our personal rights and inconveniences in this fallen world? Do we value God's witness and God's testimony above our inconveniences, our possessions, our personal freedoms? I hope you can answer those as yes. Do we recognize Satan uses every ploy so that the next time you're caught off guard by somebody coming and infringing into your territory, that Satan uses this, this is a major one in his arsenal to derail you from your walk with God. Now, I know I lose it on the freeway. We've talked about this before. You're driving along and some... Guy pulls in front of you and slams on his brakes or something, and you're, Murr! what's the matter with that idiot? And then I have to regain myself and say, wait a minute. But that's the way, in a small way, life is with all that we encounter. Another way of putting it is that at the heart of all relationships is what? Love. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, you don't generally inflict by your meism yourself. You know, none of you purposely takes a hammer and puts your finger there and goes, bam, you know, like that. You may do it by accident, but you don't do it on purpose, right? And that, that's what this is all about. And, and let's, let's look at another passage which exemplifies it. I think this concept is so important and so important in the church that this church and every church should be representative of God. Look at John chapter 13 just for a moment. We're just going to lightly look at this even though it's, it's a heavy-duty passage. John 13 verse 5. This is Christ just before the cross. His last meeting with his disciples, the Last Supper. In verse 5 it says, Then he poured water into the basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now this is not only something demeaning for just the average run-of-the-mill person because feet washing in that day, they had dirty feet because they were walking around on dusty stuff and nasty stuff. And it was the servants that did this kind of thing. But this is happens to be the Lord himself. And by this, he, he's saying, do you think you're too good to do certain things? Do you think you're too good to stoop down out of your pride and your selfishness 
to have a servant's heart? Look at this same passage down at verse 13 where he says, You call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. He's not only, he's everything, my friend. He's the God that created everything. Can you imagine that? He takes the form of a man. Philippians 2 talks about that. Humbled himself. And here he is washing old nasty feet. And by the way, in this same context, we look at, at the synoptic gospels, we find that what were they doing while this was going on? They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Selfishness. Me-focusedness. Me-ism. All of that, you see. And here is God washing their feet. Why did he do it? Verse 14, if then the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. You see, that's the, the whole idea is not where we're supposed to go around every day washing each other's feet. Uh, He's talking here about being willing to stoop to the lowest degree of common denominator on behalf of our love for one another. That I can set my rights aside on behalf of Him and, and, and because I love you and because I want to do the will of the Father. And so He's demonstrating what God is like, showing them in us real Christianity. Service, humility, obedience. Yeah. In general, what does the world see today so much of what I would call so-called Christianity? A bunch of people. It's candy-coated, but it's the prosperity gospel. They've turned it to be from being about Christ Jesus to being about me. What a bunch of junk. What a bunch of horrible stuff. What a perversion of God's Word that is. When we really and honestly look at God's Word for what it says, that we are to become like Christ Jesus, you see. Now, in this verse, he says, in verse 13, or verse 14, you, he says, you also ought to, to wash, excuse me, wash one another's feet. Ought there is the Greek word ophalo, which is a word for obligation. This is not an option as such. It's a must word. A, it's actually in the present active indicative as a verb. Now that just means that it is ongoing. It's a way of life. It's not a one-time event. Okay, I washed your feet. Now I got that over with. Well, I held my nose and went on. No. It means you continue. And he says here, I gave you. I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. How precious is that? You know, Christianity is really pretty simple, isn't it? In that sense. It's not ever about me. It's about him. I just attended a a little funeral service this week. I was thinking about that. And this person that died, which is related here to the church, somebody in the church, but I won't go to that. What they were talking about is how this person served other people. You know, they didn't talk about, you know, boy, he was such a good, he went around all puffed up about himself. You ever hear that at a funeral? I don't think so. Because what is important is what did he do before God and before others? Was he a person that served others on behalf of Christ? Yes. And then you have the well done. And then you have this attitude of Christ that not my will, but thy will be done. All right, back to our text in verse 21. There's also the other side of this that is the motive behind why we're to act this way. Notice what he says. Be subject to one another in the fear 
of Christ. We are to be constituted upon fear. Such an inherent attitude of subjection to one another is molded, in other words, in a right kind of attitude of relationship about God Himself. Again, constitution or constituted has to do with fundamental principles that govern us. In other words, it has to do with our view of God. It has to do with our view of His Word. It has to do with uh, our view of understanding what I'm supposed to be about, what I'm supposed to do. And it's anchored in this fear of God. Now, if we took the time to go there I want for time's sake, in Romans chapter 3, in that listing of the natural man, the unsaved man, in our natural condition without God, it says there, in fact, it summarizes the bottom line as there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's where we are in our society. We took God out of everything, the school, and can't talk about him anymore, and so we in, injected humanism into that, and there's just the, the, the filth and the sewer that comes into everybody's brain and mind on a continuing basis. Bless our children that are just inundated with this garbage in this age in which we live. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. What a difference that makes. Fear is phobos in the Greek. Pay attention is the idea. It's not necessarily that we're just going around shaking in our boots all the time because of God, like as if He's some kind of a cruel master because He's not. But the idea is respect for Him. It's, it's the idea of bringing attention to our life that is focused around not pleasing myself, but pleasing Him who is almighty and, and wonderful, who is my judge and my everything. That's what is so significant. Having great thoughts which are appropriate. You can't have great enough thoughts about God. Having great thoughts and great understanding of who God is. We use the word reverence, but I'm not even sure that that's adequate to even talk about. It, it, it's a starting point, a reverence before God because He is awesome. Now, let's look at how this plays out in some places. Look with me over at now, look over at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And you see it's all through, but there are some particular passages that really point our nose into it. He says in verse, he's beginning to summarize here, verse 28 of chapter 12, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken... Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service. Now, notice, this is all the same. This is the general same thing that we're looking at in Ephesians. Doing the will of God, your acceptable service to Him. And, and how do we do that? With reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. You see, that's that fear piece in there. You see that? And it's really not just one thing, it's the whole package. Reverence, because why? We ought to, st He is an awesome God. He is a holy God. He is a demanding God for His purity and righteousness. He was so demanding that He sent His own Son to die on the cross. He didn't just say, well, you know, I'll just forget about sins. No, sir. He brought about justice through His Son. He's an awesome God, and He's a consuming fire. We need to get serious about who He is, is the whole point and the whole part of that. Look back at chapter 11 and verse 7 in the halls of faith that are listed here. And, and let me just pick out Noah in verse 7. He says, By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen. Notice, in reverence. That's that same root word, phobos. Prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now, 
you ever think about the fact that Noah built an ark for 120 years? <laughs> We're not talking here about, you know, okay, next week I'll get it done. And he was by himself. There were people laughing at him. What are you, kind of a crazy nut are you? He had reverence, the fear of God. That's what it's referring to in that Old Testament when we're talking about this. Remember Solomon and his confession in Ecclesiastes? I mean, in his position as, the, as probably the most uh, dynamic uh, king in, the, in all of history, with all kinds of possessions and everything at his command and peace and all of that. And, 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 and he tried everything. He tried all the funsy things that people think of of the flesh and everything else. And he came to the conclusion it's all vanity. It means nothing. It's worthless. And he came to that conclusion at the very end. And he says, when it's all said and done, there's only one thing to do. Fear God and keep his commandments for this applies to every man that's the old testament way of talking about a true relationship with god you see it's having that kind of respect for god and we can't have accepting jesus as our savior and in some way, and yet not having a righteous kind of reverence and fear and understanding of who He is, and at the same time also following His commands. If you love Me, you'll keep My commandments. By their fruits you shall know them, said Jesus Christ. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what, does the will of My Father, which is in heaven. You see, it's a... It's a package deal, isn't it? It demonstrates who's really truly saved. And so when we're looking at this back in Ephesians, and that's why I'm hung up here for this verse 21, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Boy, this is a very potent, powerful statement. And just before it starts talking about in the relationship of the home, which has broken down in society, and the relationship of children to parents, which has broken down in society, and even in the relationship of bosses to subordinates, which has broken down in society, all of that, you see, is key because it's all in the order of God. And it is all talking about, first and foremost, your relationship to God, that you reverence Him and you stand before Him as one committed to do His will and not your own will. I hope you see that. I hope you see that. And that's seen throughout the Word of God. Christ Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, Do not fear men who can... They can even kill the body. But fear him who can cast body and soul into hell. That's a right understanding, you see. Even in Philippians 2.12, where we have work out your own salvation with fear and fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who works in you both to will and work his good pleasure. He's telling us this is not an easy road here. He's given us a task of demonstrating our faith to the world and to each other and to do it with fear of God, fear and trembling. So very, very important. And may I say this whole attitude of, of understanding reverence for God is one of the reasons I have problems with those who speak so casually about Christ and God. Yes, we can come into His throne of grace to obtain mercy. He is God, and He is gracious, and we can call Him Abba Father. He is approachable. But always remember this. He's awesome. He's awesome, and you're not. And neither am I. And we come before Him with a sincere Fear of displeasing Him. I think that's the right way to look at this.
Because fear in this context is all attached to our love. Because where Christ said, fear him who can cast body and soul in hell, he also said you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And one of the reasons that we love him is because he is awesome. Because he is holy. Because he is wonderful. And all of that. So it's all attached to the same thing. Back to where it says in chapter 2 and verse 4, God made us alive to serve him. Seems like we've been going to Luke a lot today, but in closing, go with me to Luke chapter 22. I can really equate with this. This is Peter's denial of the Lord. You know the story of that. Peter who in his cockiness and sort of the same way that we have a tendency to fuss and fight with one another and our pride gets in the way and our foolishness. Oh, Lord, I would never deny you. Christ said, before the cock crows three times, you'll deny me three times. But I think, and, and, and Luke is the only one that brings this out. Here is Peter in his final denial. Verse 60, look at this. But Peter said, man, here he'd been accused. You were, you were one of those following Christ, aren't you? Oh, no. We're told elsewhere he started using profanity. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And notice verse 61. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, I, just, I can just stop right there. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And you know what happened after that? Peter went out and wept. Can you not equate with Peter? Oh, I can. My friend, God is looking at us. I sometimes forget that and you forget it. This was obvious because he was physically on the earth and he turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine the penetrating eyes of Jesus Christ upon us in our foolishness? The next time you're trying to demand your silly rights and you're not backing off and thinking what is the right thing to do in relation before God and before others as He has commanded not to do your own will but the will of Him who sent, sent Christ in the same way we're to be imitators of Him. Think about the look of Jesus Christ upon you because He sees it all. Just like this text says. And so you see this business of subjection to others, putting others first under the governing idea of fear is no small thing. It's a big, big deal. And it must be carried into all of our attitude of, re of relationships, which we will look at that marriage and children and and bosses and others, and we'll try to look at that next time. But it's all a part of our walk of faith, living for Christ Jesus. Take up your cross and follow him. Bow with me in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for the cleansing, wonderful power authority of your word which cuts straight to our heart helps us to understand and know your will oh help us this week to be more like Christ help us father to follow your commands and trust in you in every situation Glorify your name, I pray thee, through each and every one of us that name your name. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.